Okay, first, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for a cooperative seminar from the Heartland Industrial Workers of the World. As you may or may not know, the IWW is a labor union. However, we tend to do things quite a bit differently than many of the other unions you've probably heard of. By and large, we feel their contracts between businesses and employees limit the abilities of employees to strike for better conditions during the lifetime of that contract, and oftentimes the employers will uh, just leave it up to the contract and nothing more. Um, oftentimes they will also use it to restrict what they offer and simply say that the employees agreed to the contract through the union. They therefore use it to restrict what employees are able to do while saying there is nothing they can do to get better conditions until the next contract signing. IWW uh, membership has traditionally believed in direct action as a means of achieving its goals rather than employee-employer negotiations and contracts. If the workers are satisfied, everyone is happy. However, if the workers are not satisfied, they are free to strike at any time until their demands are met. The IWW is also more immune from right-to-work laws because we do not rely on NLRB elections to bring a workplace under union guidance. For those who may not know, the NLRB stands for the National Labor Re uh, Relations Board, which is um, how uh, unions are able to get contracts with um, employers. If a worker is happy with the work of their local IWW branch, they should choose to remain a member because of what they do and um, because of what we do and who we are rather than simply because their workplace is under a union contract. This also helps us to know we are doing the right thing and if we screw up, it will show through a decrease in our numbers. Workers are not forced to be a part of our union and we want them to be with us because they believe we are doing the right thing. So, if we're a labor union, why are we suddenly interested in starting businesses rather than organizing them? Well, there are several reasons, actually. Traditional unionism requires very strategic campaigns to achieve their goals. Generally, these campaigns are very time-consuming, and due to the nature of unionism in general, we don't really know how many campaigns outside of the IWW are successful, because we don't really know how many have failed and never became public. Funding for these campaigns is generally based around membership dues, and for smaller branches, this can be a problem. It's difficult to support workers during a strike, and it's difficult when they are fired because of union activity, which does happen, even though it is illegal for employers to fire workers as a result of unionizing. In America, union membership is also only at 10.8%, showing the difficulties we face with campaigns. Many also fear targeting because of their activities, face separation from workers they are trying to unionize on the inside, and face a loss of work due to facility closures upon a successful campaign. This means that even if we are successful in organizing a warehouse or restaurant, there is still the possibility that the place of business will close rather than choosing to accept the union. They may even close for a temporary period and open under a new name in a new location with just enough changes to make it appear as though the new business has moved in. For these reasons, we feel that a secondary tactic is needed to fight for workers' rights, which is democratically run worker cooperatives. One of the main differences between the <coughs> IWW and other unions is its support of a specific type of worker cooperative known as the Wobbly Stop. For those who may not know, IWW members have traditionally been known as Wobblies, although no one really remembers how the name got started. There are several theories, but without any definitive documentation, we'll likely never know the origin of the word. Under the Wobbly Shop model, <clears throat> under the Wobbly Shop model, workers elect delegates who can be recalled at any time. These decisions of these delegates can also be overridden by workers through a vote. In this way, those who are elected to power uh, can either make decisions that workers support or they can have their decisions removed or they can have their decisions overturned and face removal from power. I have had several people assume that cooperatives do not have any leadership and that every decision, no matter how small, must be discussed and voted on by the group. While you could certainly set up your business in such a manner, it is more likely that companies will use a combination of leadership decisions that can be overturned if needed alongside committees to make decisions rather than having everyone uh, make every decision outside of the company policy. For example, if your cooperative is a restaurant, you could choose a few individuals to make menu changes and then bring those changes for the group to approve rather than call for a company meeting 
um, for every change that is made. Due to the democratic nature of cooperatives, they are a natural fill to a void that has existed in traditional unionism for a long time. Rather than waiting for workers to become so disgruntled and stressed that they uh, start to act, we can begin building alternatives that workers can move towards, while also pressuring companies that do not follow these principles to transition or be ran out of business. There is also less risk to workers looking for change to turn to cooperative building rather than traditional unionizing for their workplace as they will not face the same risk of firing or facility closure that they would otherwise. Of course, the employer could try to use non-competitive agreements to prevent workers from forming their own businesses when uh, the new business could compete with the old, but most hiring does not currently include such uh, legal contracts. HR departments also tend to uh, talk from one business to another, so an employee's label of unionist may prevent future jobs. HR does not officially do this, of course, but yeah, it does occur. A similar issue is known as interlocking directorate, where an executive at one company may also sit on the board of another company and inform either business of potential unionists. Utilizing the cooperative model, the union would also not be forced to foot the bill for a campaign, regardless of its success, nor would there be monetary penalties to the union uh, due to failure. Business loans, crowdfunding, and other sources of funding become available. And while crowdfunding could also be utilized in traditional union campaigns, you can't really say why you're raising funds when the campaign has not yet become public. If you are trying to organize a fast food restaurant, for example, and the union has not made it public that they are organizing the restaurant, you can't turn to the GoFundMe and ask for donations for the campaign. It could also appear that you're asking for resources without an explanation or, in the case of a non-public failed campaign, you are requesting resources, but that they were never made transparent after the failure. When building a cooperative, the workers are involved. The workers who are involved will generally share the same goal. If you join a group that is attempting to build a cooperative to provide low-cost housing, or excuse me, if you are trying attempting to build a cooperative to provide low-cost but high-quality prosthesis, the workers are generally um, focused on that task. Not everyone in a uh, union campaign is there for the campaign. Yes, the union members who initiated it and those in leadership roles likely are, but it is unknown how many will vote yes when the NLRB election occurs. The time it takes to start a cooperative is usually less than for a union campaign, except for the most extreme examples. For retail, a business could be established in as little as six months, although we seriously recommend taking your time and doing everything properly rather than swiftly. Uh, shortly, we will examine what is needed to do this. There is also the option to purchase an existing business and transition it to a cooperative uh, for those who wish to take that route. One example is a car uh, wash in California where management attempted to take the resources earned by the workers and close the business. The workers was to remain open and chose to buy the business out, running it under the cooperative model. One of the main reasons to use cooperative formation as a union tool is the success rate of cooperatives. In the U.S. it is difficult to get many numbers, but we do have a few. However, we have a sizable body of evidence from other countries that uh, speak to the cooperative's um, success rate uh, to make up for the smaller number of comparisons in the United States. In France, for example, we can see that an 80 to 90 percent uh, success rate of cooperatives compared to a 66% rate for all French businesses. This is over a five-year term and shows that for every 100 traditional businesses started at the same time as 100 cooperatives, only 66 traditional businesses will remain, while 80 to 90 cooperatives will remain. When a business is purchased, the rate becomes 61 to 82% success rate for cooperatives over a five-year span, compared to 50% for all French businesses. In British Columbia, these numbers are 66.6%, compared with 39 to 43 for all businesses. When considering evolution and survival of the fittest, cooperatives are showing themselves to be the fittest. When recessions um, lead to business closures, cooperatives also remain the most likely to still be open when it ends. In other words, not only are cooperatives more democratic, they are simply more resilient. If we promote the cooperative mode of production and push to open co-ops like we do traditional businesses, 
then we will eventually um, overtake the businesses and be the dominant system. This is true for all studies beyond those listed above. The one exception is that cooperatives that do not elect some type of leadership um, and attempt to make all decisions as a whole do experience problems. This does not mean management should have complete control. Quite the uh, contrary, their decisions should always be able to be overturned and they should always be able to be recalled. I've been told on several occasions that the nature of cooperatives will lead them to implode due to factionalization and uh, politicization due to differing opinions, uh, but the numbers simply do not show this. In France, Canada, and anywhere else that a study has been made, cooperatives generally show between 10 and 30 percentage points um, higher for resilience than their authoritarian counterparts. This also fits in line with the concept of game theory and the work of Axelrod, which hypothesize that the most successful actors cooperate with each other and accept that mistakes do occur, but will take action if an individual begins to take advantage of others. That is going a bit off topic, however, so just understand that cooperatives have been shown to be evolutionarily advantageous and that as a result of the success rate of cooperative business discussed so far, this type of business structure deserves a higher rate of interest over their authoritarian counterparts. But enough about why we should use cooperatives. You're here today to learn how to build one. For this, we will start with the charter document. This document will help you remain on topic and helps others understand what it is you're wanting to accomplish. The co-op charter will also outline um, the business case that explains why your business is needed in the community and how it, how it will help others. This might seem obvious to you when you conceive the idea, but remember that others will be working on this project with you, and what seems obvious to one person may not be obvious to others, or may be completely misunderstood. The ideas that you have, uh, that you have may or may not be understood the same way by others as they are by you, and the explanations you give may seem complete uh, to you, but may not lead others to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish. This also ensures that you do not misunderstand what is uh, what the group is trying to say. Um, your charter should also list the objectives of the business along with the goals and deliverables that you hope to provide. For example, if you're creating a publishing house for works of science fiction, you would list only the products that you would offer, such as editing and proofreading, but may not actually print the books yourself. For anyone who is assisting or coming into the cooperative at a later time, they would know that someone would have to find a print shop to fill this need. This also helps eliminate purchasing equipment that will not be used or offering services that you will not actually have the time or resources to offer. You may not have time initially to fill such services should you try to incorporate it into your plan, um, so it is better to start smaller with something that you actually have the resources to accomplish and move into other areas later when you can do so successfully rather than set your goals too high, run out of cash or other resources and have to close before you ever begin simply because you wanted to do it all now <clears throat> rather than wait until you can. This might be a bit blunt, but it does happen. Another aspect to consider is the startup cost. Whether you use crowdfunding, a credit union loan, or other means of obtaining capital, people are more likely to work with you when you demonstrate what it is you're doing and how much you'll need to do it. If you walk into um, this and just say, I need some cash, you're likely to get stares and questions that will eventually lead you to calculate your costs at a later time, so it is really better to save the heartache and just do it now. You will also have to save yourself from embarrassment in front of others, um, of the, in front of the financial advisors, when you show up looking prepared, and they will be more willing to help you refine your request when you show that you are serious about your business. If you can think of any, a list of risks will also help you to find a way to mitigate um, what could happen in the future should the need arise. I'd recommend starting with risks that would occur uh, during the creation process and maybe just after rather than what may happen 20 years down the road, but you should definitely consider those once the cooperative is up and running. No, you won't think of everything, but skipping this step will really leave your business vulnerable to problems that can occur and could easily be solved. Think about this year, next year, and maybe the third year, but don't go too far out if possible. This plan can be revised to cover later issues at a later time, especially those that will occur only during long-term operation rather than during the startup. Right now, worry about getting your business off the ground and what happens just after. For many of you, the charter and the business plan that follows will be the most boring part of the uh, project, 
unless you are looking to form a co-op for the CPAs or business or uh, project management. You are not likely to really care about this and just want to dive into menu creation for your new restaurant. Uh, while that's coming, um, this has to be done first to ensure that everything is in order. Lastly, when talking about the charter, um, you will need to consider who it is you will need to help the business. If you're going into farming, you will need someone to drive the tractor, someone to milk the cows, and so on to make sure everything gets done. If you have friends who are helping and everyone has already decided what they will be doing, that's excellent. If not, it's uh, to the job boards and finding a new member who will help. The second thing you'll have to worry about uh, is the, in your project milestones of your new cooperative. Excuse me, the second thing are the project milestones of your new cooperative. You can think about some of the milestones you'll have to accomplish, but this really begins once all uh, or nearly all positions are filled. For the most part, our project milestone example will contain most of what you need to accomplish this, but you might want to refine it or make it more understandable to meet your needs better, as ours are pretty generic. Obviously, we are not able to uh, think about the startup of every business, and some revision will be needed to make this fit your plan. I would also recommend trying to follow your milestones in order, but if something that occurs later suddenly becomes doable before an earlier stage, uh, go for it. So if everyone agrees with the location before the end of the first meeting, just cross that item off the list even though it is halfway down the page. Don't worry about waiting for it unless something happens before your business can move in. The first milestone is of course the project charter. We went into this pretty in-depth earlier, so I'll not be talking about it much right now unless you have any questions. The second one is the kickoff meeting. This is where you explain the objectives to everyone in the group. Some members may know, they may be friends or co-workers, while others may be people you brought in along the way because they needed a job, and they may not know entirely what you are doing. This is the time to fill them in on the objectives of your group, what you will be doing, and what they will be asked to do for the group. You will also begin the bylaw creation process, and we do have a sample bylaws on our heartlandiww.org page. Once on the page, click on Literature, then click on Other, and locate the portion labeled Co-op Construction. All of the documents discussed today can be located there. As I was saying, you will need to meet with everyone you will be working with, ensure everyone is on the same page, and knows what they will be doing, and learn about the backgrounds of the members so you can begin to formulate ideas of who you, would, who you feel would make a good officer, and what officers you will need. At the bylaw acceptance meeting is where you will come together to accept the bylaws. Hopefully, everyone has been discussing them before now and has had a chance to provide input into the bylaws. This meeting is where you will vote to accept the bylaws and, after the vote, will be following what is outlined by the bylaws as your co-op's governing document. Essentially, the bylaws are the constitution of your business. You will also need to determine if you will be acting as a cooperative corporation or an LLC that is functioning as a cooperative through the bylaws. After the bylaws are in place, you will be able to elect the directors of, and other officers of your cooperative. At this stage, everyone hopefully knows each other a lot better than at the uh, kickoff meeting. Everyone has also hopefully been communicating more both inside and outside of meetings, have discussed the ideas you have for the business, uh, with other members and have begun to feel comfortable electing someone for officer positions. If everyone knew each other before this project began, such as a group of co-workers coming from a closed business or had become disgruntled and feel they can do a better job, then this could be uh, completed in the kickoff meeting. Regardless of when officers are chosen, it must be done before paperwork is submitted to the state that makes your business official. Which brings us to the next point. Articles of incorporation are required in Missouri, and I'm fairly certain they will be required in any state that you are looking for, uh, looking to form your cooperative corporation or LLC in. They may be under different names. I'm not sure. I'm not a business lawyer, so you'd have to look that up with a, you'd have to check with a lawyer um, in the state that you're citing in. Um, actually, LLCs use a document called Articles of Organization instead of an Article of Incorporation, um, which still may be required and is very similar to the Articles of Incorporation. These documents let the state know about your business, who is in it, and who the officers are. It also allows the state to know how to get in contact with your officers and the business. Obviously, 
When starting a business, you will need to determine where the business will be located. This may seem simple, but it may not be as easy as you think. For example, if you're trying to open a vegan restaurant in an area where most people eat meat and few, if any vegans exist, it probably will not have the success you planned on. A steakhouse in the middle of a mostly vegetarian area would likely have the same problem. You also want to keep a list of what resources will be required for your business. Keep this list as detailed as possible because it will be um, it, because it will contain all of the equipment you will be needing, the cost of that equipment, any type of outside assistance such as installation of equipment, and the cost of that assistance. Keep a price list alongside your list of any resources that will be used. Keep a list of companies that you will be using as well so that you will not have to research for these resources when you're ready to have them installed. Once you have your location and know what is needed, You'll want to be able to call them and get them, uh, get them in and started as quickly as possible. After you have done all this, you should know about how much you'll be uh, needing, which will make it a lot easier to secure funding because you will have the documents showing what you will need and how much these resources will require. This will be much better than going in blindly and asking for cash. It is better to consider any option that is available rather than trying to limit what you are doing. Consider traditional loans. Consider crowdfunding, consider investors. One thing to note is that some types of cooperatives, such as cooperative apartments, may find traditional loans um, more difficult because the bank may not want to invest in the business over a mortgage. While most people at our seminars are not looking to fund cooperative housing, this is good to know for those who are. I have also heard but cannot prove that some banks have not wanted to loan to a known cooperative business. Unfortunately, I can't say one way or another on this, but it is something to keep in mind. Most places, of course, will not be doing this, and if you have a good business plan and can prove that you can pay them back, it is unlikely they will really care what kind of business you are. Also, the uh, Small Business Association, or SBA, um, is a government program and does have a section dedicated to cooperative businesses, which may come in handy. The Work Breakdown Structure and Legal Docs. Obviously, you will need to outline what work needs to be done and establish your cooperative and who is responsible for completing each task. Um, it will be a lot easier if people know who, um, what they are responsible for, and it will be easier for others to know what someone is responsible for. If something has not been completed, they can then find who was responsible for completing that task and can easily discover why it has or has not been done. It can also make it easier to find out um, who needs to be moving on to the next task and what tasks need to be completed before opening day. Legal documents are definitely one of those things you need to get done. Um, there are some things we've discussed today that may be able, that you may or may not be able to get by with uh, not doing properly. Legal documents are not one of them. You're going against traditional capitalist business and will be shut down really quickly if they can find anything that makes your business invalid. Make sure your articles of incorporation or organization are accepted. Restaurants, make sure you have health certificates. If you are at a pharmacy, make sure that all of your pharmacists are licensed. Make sure you have your business license in order. Any certificate or license that you feel you may need, check it out and make sure you get a lawyer's input before going through with opening day. If there is something they can catch you on, the, your competition will do everything they can to get you out of the way. The last thing you should worry about is quality check. Make sure that all of your um, equipment is functional. Make sure that your product is functional and working as expected and debugged. Make sure as well that everyone you are working with is trained and identify those who uh, still need training and new employees who may uh, need to be brought up to speed on what's going on. If everything looks good, then you are ready for opening day. This means that all of your hard work is paid off and the workers of this company own the means of production. Oh. And make sure you and your fellow workers remain in contact with the IWW. Your business is a strong part of the industrial union you belong to. Um, your business and fellow workers, of course, have the right to join the IWW and any future research committees that may arise. Any cooperative that joins the research committee um, should also have the ability to utilize, utilize its finding. An example for this would be the recent COVID pandemic. Any cooperative, um, though likely pharmaceutical in this case, who contributed resources to the discovery of vaccine would have the right to produce and implement that vaccine. 
This does not necessarily mean the committee is required to look at only one solution, and subcommittees could be created to test multiple possible solutions until one is discovered. Okay, we are getting closer. Let's think about our bylaws for a second. There are two ways to go about setting up a cooperative. One is a cooperative corporation, and the other is a member-managed LLC, which has bylaws that are based around cooperative ideals. Uh, neither one is really a wrong choice, and for the most part, it is simply a matter of opinion regarding how you want your taxes to be taken out. Uh, usually, corporations will distribute profit as dividends, while LLCs are passed through where your profits are received as individuals, and you will pay taxes as an individual rather than as a group. Of course, we are not tax professionals, so make, your, make sure you speak to one or a lawyer before accepting what we say here. We, of course, are not trying to give tax advice. Yes, there are some business. There are some differences between a cooperative corporation and an LLC, but a democratic business is a democratic business, and the decisions will be made the same way in either case, which is, of course, by the workers. For today's seminar, the bylaws of a cooperative corporation will be the focus. Please note, I think the example bylaws that I am using today comply with Missouri law, but again, we are not lawyers, and this should not be taken as legal advice. Consult a lawyer before you do anything with the bylaws. Again, these bylaws and other documents discussed here are available on our website, heartlandiww.org. Click on Literature, and then click on Other, and locate the Co-op Construction section. The sample bylaws here are based around a sample bylaw created by Sarah Kaplan and Jennifer Kovar, and drafted by Janelle Orsi of the Sustainable, Econ Econom the Sustainable Economies Law Center. We are not affiliated with this group in any way, but I do thank them for placing this draft online so we could play with it. A few changes did have to be made so they complied fully with the Wobbly Stop model, such as utilizing a committee of workers from a respective department to elect managers rather than board appointment. Uh, most of the bylaws, however, are unchanged from the original version we found on uh, the website Ducracy. Another issue was the originals allowing for a limited number of members in a cooperative. In the belief of the IWW, if you work it, you should own it. Limiting members could lead to a hierarchy of cronies. We are not against a hierarchy when the delegates and officers are elected by all of the workers, but we should not limit who can vote or who is allowed membership. Looking at the bylaws, one thing to focus on is voluntary and open membership. We believe that any worker who wants to become a member uh, should have the right to do so. Cooperatives do have the legal right to limit membership, and while we disagree with doing this, um, we would still likely help those so long as the limit is not too extreme. For example, if you have 100 employees and want to limit membership to three, then of course it is unlikely we will help. Uh, cooperatives are required to have one meeting per year, um, with at least 30 days of notice prior to this meeting. Um, one member would have one vote, rather than one vote uh, uh, rather than vote allocation based around the number of shares purchased, which is, of course, the method used by traditional authoritarian companies. Workers should also set a quorum. We do not have a set quorum, and the uh, we do not have a set quorum, and the workers are free to choose one they feel is sufficient. But we do recommend that this number is neither too large, uh, that is rarely met, or so small that few individuals can run the. Uh, can run the business without the input of most workers. The decisions by management or the board can always be overturned by the workers, provided, of course, that the decisions by the worker is legal. Obviously, if management decides to pay taxes for the quarter and the workers overturn the decision, the taxes will still have to be paid or the business will be shut down. Another thing is direct election of management, officers, and board members. This means that at a workplace, the section of software engineers will be able to determine who their, or who their management would be. The accountants would be able to determine their management, and everyone at the company would be able to determine who the officers and board members would be. Legally, there are some officers who are required by law, such as the position of treasurer. Required officers may change by state or even within the state from year to year. So check with a lawyer to see who is required in your state uh, when forming your business. Regardless, some will be required by law. 
if you're trying to form a cooperative that has zero hierarchy, you will still have to um, pick someone or several individuals if the state requires it who accept these positions, even if it's in name only, and is answerable to the state. Officer and board decisions can, of course, be overturned by the workers. If they make a decision that the workers disagree with, then, according to the sample bylaws, the workers have a two-week period to overturn the decision before it goes into effect. This, of course, does not apply if the decision um, was made to fulfill a legal requirement, and an exemption could be made that the decision could be put into effect immediately with the ability to be overturned later if the safety of workers and others was at stake. Policy is voted on by the workers as a whole. If workers decide, they can uh, choose to allow the board and management to make decisions on their behalf, but always reserve the right to um, veto any decision through a vote. We understand that the workers have work to do and may not want to be uh, present for minor discussions or decisions that are made. That's fine, so long as they have the right to veto any decision if necessary. This prevents management from selling the business without worker consent or from creating business deals that go against the interest of the workers. Bylaw changes would, of course, need to be approved by the group. The board cannot decide to modify bylaws and give themselves all power. Bylaws would have to be approved first. It would thus be a waste of time to try to pass decisions that go against the workers, although someone will still likely try this at some point. The last thing we need to discuss is conducting meetings in a cooperative. For this, the IWW uses a variation on Robert's rules called Rusty's Rules of Order. If you have a few individuals, Rusty's will help to fill in the blanks if you notice areas of contention. Over time, though, your business will expand and you will need some way of conducting meetings with multiple individuals. Even if the group agrees to meet only um, once or twice each year, you'll still need a way to determine who is speaking, the order of their speaking, and managing the length of each speaker's spiel. There's another option used by uh, many cooperatives called sociocracy. This method uses consent rather than majority vote. Decisions are made when there are no um, paramount objections. There's also a hierarchy of semi-autonomous circles, um, which are similar to departments, software uh, circle, accounting circle, etc. This will help to solve some of the um, factional and political issues that arise from the parliamentary uh, majority rule system of Robert's rules, or Rusty's rules. The most important thing to remember about meetings is to make them as short as possible, because people quickly lose interest and their attention span will only last so long. By and large, most meetings um, should discuss what needs to be done and to gather ideas on how to do it rather than present long presentations and a well-defined agenda should be created before the meeting begins. And yes, this will also include voting on ideas by the members, uh, by the meeting's participants. Without a veto option on membership's de uh, decisions by officers, management, or the board, unless the decision um, would be illegal, of course. If the workers decide to do something, management does not have the last word. To run the meeting, you should choose an individual to facilitate the meeting. This person is in charge of ensuring the discussion remains on topic, moving between topics, and calling the meeting to order. A timekeeper uh, will, of course, monitor the speaking time. A stack taker will keep track of who is speaking next, and a recording secretary will keep the minutes of the meeting. Of all of these positions, the recording ser uh, secretary is the most important because you're required to keep a uh, meeting of minutes. Small meetings may not need a stack taker or timekeeper, but minutes cannot be ignored. Meeting minutes also protect the group if someone at a later time challenges that a decision was made, as they can show who introduced it, how many voted for it, and when it was implemented. There may also be legal requirements in your area that require meetings, meeting minutes to be kept. This concludes our seminar. Please feel free to contact us at heartlandiww at gmail.com. If you have any questions about this seminar, have suggestions, or would like to join the Heartland branch of the Industrial Workers of the World.